So I want to start by introducing myself very briefly. My name is Hanan. I am a digital marketing consultant and I'm a trainer. Um, I've got many years of experience. I'm not going to age myself and say how many years, <laughs> over nine years experience in digital marketing. Um, I've worked on agency side and client side. Um, I've worked in the UK. I've actually just recently relocated to um, Dubai about two years ago. And um, I've worked with many brands in the region, um, out with the UAE as well, so Saudi and Jordan. Um, my main expertise lie in strategy. So pulling all your marketing um, elements and marketing mix together to give a comprehensive strategy, um, content planning as well, and um, go to launch campaigns. So this is where I specialize in. So that's my day job. And then I have a night job, <laughs> which is um, podcasting. I actually am very passionate about podcasting. So I've actually started helping some of the brands in the region um, with their podcasts. I've started my own podcast. It's It feels very liberating to speak into a mic and not have it monitored by everybody. It's a bit like YouTube, but you're hiding behind the mic rather than being so visible in front of the screen. So um, yeah, there's amazing podcasts coming out of the region. Um, you can listen to so many different kind of genres nowadays. So I'd really recommend you start trying to listen to audio. <laughs> um, and I also have a little passion um, to support female-led businesses. Uh, nothing against the men here, but I really felt since moving to the region that um, female-led businesses really need that boost. So th that's a little bit about me. Ramble over. <laughs> now we can actually start with the actual course. Um, I want to kind of cover really quickly um, what we were going to go over today. Um, we're going to highlight why email marketing is important. We're going to go through how to actually get started, how to integrate it into your marketing mix, what are the steps required to actually make it effective, um, what content to create, and I'll skim over some automations. There's a lot more detail that will be covered in the course that Astrolab offers, but I want to introduce you to the importance of automations and the options you have and the possibilities there, there are with email automations. And then metrics, because obviously, like anything in digital marketing, email marketing is also very easy to measure and track. So it's really important to have that in mind when you're um, creating your email marketing strategy. As Kate mentioned, if throughout the presentation you guys have questions, you can just unmute and interrupt me. I'll be blabbering a lot. <laughs> um, or you can just um, put it in the comments in the chat box. So I wanted to start off with some myths because email marketing is not usually as attractive as Instagram or TikTok. And I think there's a lot of myths that go about um, email marketing when, when you first think about it, um, especially if you haven't used it yourself. I don't know, have any of you guys used email marketing in your businesses before? No, have you used it for in, in businesses that you've worked for maybe, or seen it work or not work? Okay, whenever you're comfortable, just pop your answers in the chat or unmute. Um, there's a lot of stigma around email marketing because the first impression usually or the instinct is email marketing is spammy. It's spammy. We don't want to send, we don't want to annoy our clients. We don't want to annoy people. We don't want to annoy um, these lists of, of, of you know, potential customers that could actually be enthusiastic about our brand. And the thing is, when email marketing first started, it was really successful. And then it went through a phase of being spammy. It was spammy. There wasn't a lot of regulations around it. Um, there wasn't a lot of ease about, you know, every like nowadays, anyone can really sign up to an email marketing platform tool and send emails. And that was just starting. And there wasn't a lot of training or awareness about how to not spam people. Ultimately, people were sending um, emails to any email that they found. It wasn't relevant to their business necessarily. Um, they were sending high volumes. And sometimes it was with the intention of selling. And sometimes it was in the, with the intention of actually scamming and like phishing people. So 
I understand why email marketing has built that reputation, but we've come a long way since then. There's been a lot of um, law, data protection laws internationally that protect users' data. Um, countries and governments have installed them. Um, there's a lot being implemented within the tools themselves. So if a lot of people report the business, a lot of the tools will actually block the business from sending further emails. There's a lot of best practices now that um, is very like um, there's a lot of awareness about sorry about, about best practices that people now understand to avoid being spammy. So if you do email marketing right and you send the email to the right audience, it won't be spammy at all. Um, another myth that we want to dis demystify today is that email marketing is dead. So I hear this so much from clients. It's like, who even opens their email anymore? You know, everyone's on TikTok or on in social media or on Facebook, and that's where people hang out. They're not going to read an email we sent them. It's just a waste of time. But actually, more than 50% of the world's population use email. And what do you need to set up a social media account? You need an email that is actually active. So everybody is, is, that is on social media has email. So what's really important is again, to think about, and, and that's what we're gonna go through today, is who are we speaking to with, with our email and where are we getting our list from? And that brings us to the next point, which is buying an email list is a great hack and it's a great fast way to reach your target audience. There's so many companies online or even offline that will sell you um, amazing lists that are tailored to your industry and you know they look so attractive and it seems like you figured out this hack because you suddenly have all this data that you can email but that is the, not the truth at all it's the worst thing you can do it is not a warm audience it is not someone who it, it's kind of spammy actually because it's not someone who's heard of you before even people that have opted in to getting emails from third parties or people that have opted into getting, getting emails from you know, partner companies if they have signed up with someone else, they're not, they don't know who you are when you land on their inbox. So they're very likely to ignore you, to delete you, to put you in their junk or to just like report you. So this is definitely not a, a, um, a hack that, you, that I would recommend you do. Um, the last, myth which is also quite controversial is that social media is so much better than email marketing because that's where people are at again it's like the same kind of thinking and mindset is that you know social media just works better and actually they shouldn't be compared because they need to work along each other um, and they need to be all a part of your mix which we're going to talk about today and there is a time for social media and there's a need for social media, but then there's also an opportunity with email marketing that has a much higher conversion rate to social media. And we'll talk about that just now, because it's really important to understand before you invest your, your time and your energy learning about this, why is it that I need to even do that in the first place? So we've demystified the myths. So now let's think about why email marketing is actually great. So the first point is that social media algorithms are not reliable. If you're just gonna rely on producing so much content and just relying on social media, getting your content in front of the right audience, it's not the most reliable channel if you're solely relying on it. So for example, if you produce content regularly, you will start noticing that some content has higher reach than others. You will start noticing that although your following is growing, a big percentage of them are actually not seeing your content. So there's that kind of algorithm game that you're constantly chasing with social media. And it's important to chase the algorithm game. It's important to be present on social media, but it's not reliable. So with email marketing, it's your own database, which is the second point. It's your own database that you're owning. So you're collecting people that are opting in to speak to you, to hear from you. So if God forbid, no one wants to hear this, but if Instagram were to get hacked or if Instagram or TikTok or Facebook were to, you know, shut down one day or create regulations or delete your followers, then you've also created the security of your own customer database that you know are interested in your product. You're not just relying on another external website to promote and market your product for you. 
Another thing is there's been so many studies, and this has been increasing year on year, more so recently than before. Email marketing has such a high return on investment. Obviously, you need to do email marketing right, which is what we're going to go through today. But if you do it right, it will have a significantly higher return on investment and like actual results when it comes to conversion compared to social media and any other channel, really, including ads. So what happens with email marketing is that or what the difference is, is that you're actually speaking to, to, to an audience that's kind of opted in. They, they want to hear from you. So they're more likely to be convinced of a sale because they're lower in the funnel, which we're going to talk about in more detail as well. Um, you can go see a lot of these studies and see the, the percentages of, you know, average percentages globally of what other channels convert and email marketing beats all of them. Um, and I've seen this, to be honest, personally with my own clients, um, where we implement a good email marketing strategy and a few months down the line, we actually see more conversion rates. And then you can see on Google Analytics that one of the main channels, not of traffic, but of conversion is always email. So while social media is great at bringing traffic, it's not always the best to actually convert people to buy. Um, then we've got like the amazing factor of like email marketing allowing you to personalize your content. With social media, you are kind of gauging who you're speaking to and you're creating content that's tailored to them, but it's not personalized on their journey. It's not personalized on you know, how they've interacted with your brand. It's not personalized on if they heard from you before or if they've just followed you on social media last week or if they've been on, their, on your website five times, if they've visited, you know, your website and added to cart or not. It's not personalized at all. The, the organic content that's on, on social media is, like I said, tailored to a general persona that you create. Whereas with email marketing, you're actually able to personalize the content so much more, which makes it a lot more effective because you're able to speak to the client or the customer or the potential customer in a way that really resonates with their pain points. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm going to keep emphasizing this just to remind everybody, uh, like Kate said, it's a time to kind of grow and learn. So please let me know if there's anything that sounds confusing or you want more information about. So where I'd like to start is understand is by making you understand where email marketing fits in all your marketing strategy. This is where I specialize in and I think it's really important to start there so that you are aware of where it fits in the bigger picture so that you're able to create the most effective email marketing campaigns. Have any of you guys thought about where it could fit or are you guys, um, I don't, I'm not sure, no, not, not a lot of people answered my question if you guys are using email marketing, but for those who are using email marketing, where do you see it fit best? Um, I don't know if we have an, uh, an, an audience that is keen to engage today, but is anyone keen to share their experience? Okay, that's fine. Um, we can, I can tell you. <laughs> if you don't want to tell me your opinion, I can tell you. Um, there's a few things that we need to go through. So first of all, I'll just give you a brief introduction to the marketing mix. And it's really important to have this overview so that you're able to visualize where you want to fit it in your, in your operation, in your team, or even in your day, and how much to dedicate to it. You've got your paid media, your earned media, and your owned media. And I'll give you a very very brief introduction to each one. So you've got your owned media, which is everything you create and you own with your team. So I, I'm sorry, I think someone needs to maybe um, mute because my voice is echoing and I'm just worried that um, it might affect how others hear me. Thank you. So your owned media is everything you create internally. You own it, um, your website content you've worked hard with your team to create, to, to, to send as a message to everybody online. It's your digital assets. So your website, your blog, all your profiles on social media, the content that you've created on social media. And that's where your email marketing fits in. So it's your own. And the additional, additional point, which is 
not only do you own your marketing email content, but you also own your database. So it fits within your own media. Then you've got your earned media, which is everything that comes externally that you haven't paid for. So media coverage, um, people writing reviews about you in Google or on social media, um, people sharing your content on, on a, across different channels, that's earned media. And it's important to have a balance of all kind of three forms of media to really make an effective marketing strategy. And then you've got your paid media, which is your outreach or your retargeting that you pay for, including ads and if you pay influencers. So these are kind of three elements and um, email marketing needs to fit in within your own media. And I emphasize that because that's one of the biggest advantages of, of email marketing. Then we've got the lovely funnel, which either you hate or you love. Personally, as a marketer, I love it because it just makes things, it makes things like put into perspective and it makes things make sense. So I'll give you again a quick overview of the funnel. This is all obviously explained in much more detail in the course, but I think I can give you a comprehensive idea. So we've got like the funnel, which starts with like the top funnel, people move through the funnel to the middle and then to the bottom before they buy something from you. So these are kind of the different stages that a user goes through online as they're being introduced to your brand, being warmed up and nurtured, and then actually deciding to make a decision to proceed of, you know, making a conversion, buying something from you. So usually people start with getting to know you for the first time. So, um, they get to see your content on social media. Maybe they see um, some influencer wearing your, your brand, or maybe they see an ad on, um, on Google or on Instagram, or maybe they read a blog because they were searching for something specific. So it's kind of the first interaction they have um, with your brand. Then as people interact with you, that's when they either build interest or they just they're like this is not for me this is not what i was looking for if they build interest at this first interaction then they enter your funnel once they enter your funnel and they're more interested after the first impression they go down the funnel of being more engaged so they usually read more blogs or they bookmark your website or they follow you or they take an action of commenting on one of your items um they're more engaged with you because you're speaking their language, you're kind of hitting a pain point that they that they have. And this is when you can start thinking about what kind of gated content, which is what we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail. This is how you capture this audience and start thinking about how to get their emails and their data. This is a good time when they're engaged, they're interested, they're not in any way ready to buy from you, but they're just interested in the value you have to offer. Um, and it's usually called like gated content because it's gated by them needing to put their email and their data in, in order for them to get that more access and more value. We're going to talk about many examples for that today. Then as they get that, so they download something or they try a trial or they get more value in some way, they go move down the funnel to they are more interested in the product now than they did before. They're, they have an understanding of maybe what you have to offer in more detail. And they're willing to give you their email. They're willing to try a trial. They want to read your testimonials. And this is a good time to start nurturing them with some emails. So emails could be like, you know, these are like the five ways you can optimize your website. And it's actually the nurturing them to buying a service that you know could help them grow their business so this is when they reach the middle funnel so this these are considered warm to hot leads these are people that are really engaged you know they need they have a problem that you could solve this is where email marketing becomes most effective nurturing them through this journey of middle to hot and making them kind of convinced that this is what they need and selling ultimately to them. So when they take action, email marketing is so effective before they take the action as well as after they take the action. So prior to that, you're nurturing them, you're giving them value, you're giving them deals, you're giving them an exclusive offer, and it's all done through email marketing. 
you're giving them sales support. And then post-purchase, they are nurtured to become a more loyal customer. And that is also through multiple series of emails that you need to send to them. So things like introducing them to loyalty programs, telling them to refer a friend, offering them an incentive to refer a friend. All of this is much more effective when it's on email marketing. Offering them complimentary products that you have because they've bought a printer, you know, offering them other things that, you know, could come with their printer or knowing that they work from home. So offering them services that complement whatever it is they actually purchased. So there's a lot that you can sell to an existing customer as well. If you keep nurturing that relationship and speaking their, to their pain points post conversion as well. Does that make sense? I tried to make it really brief. Obviously the funnel you, I could talk about it for an hour, but I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of where you can use email marketing at different stages. So from cold to hot, does that make sense? So, okay, someone's asking what's <laughs> top of funnel. So T-O-F-U is top of funnel and then middle of funnel and then bottom of funnel. So it, you can really ignore that. It's, it's just to kind of identify where the top is and where the bottom is. I hope that answers that. Okay, I was just checking the chat if there's any more questions. Okay, so I'm assuming you're sold and you wanna get starting with, like, you wanna get started with email marketing. You have to be sold. I can't sell it any more than I did. Okay. So where do you go from here? Um, how do you get started to create something effective? Because obviously you can buy a list, you can do so many things that are big no-nos and they're not gonna give you a result. But how do you create something that is actually worth the time you're gonna invest in? I've done six steps for you just to make it really compact and digestible and not overwhelm you. You need to choose a platform and we're gonna go through each one in more detail now. You need to choose the right platform for you, for the size of your company, for the capacity you have, for the where you're at, if you've done email marketing before, if you haven't, you need to build a list and build a list ethically, build a list that will really generate actual results. You need to segment that list or at least think about how you wanna segment that list. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. You wanna create automations and think about constantly what automations you can create to lower the workload for yourself. And then you want to think and start planning for what valuable content you have to offer based on the segments you've created. Then you want to measure this performance as you send this content out and then continuously go and improve from the start. So obviously you're not going to change the platform every time you change, you create an email. But as you outgrow some platforms and you start advancing your email marketing operation, you should consider what other platforms and tools there are out there. I've curated a list of, um, I think you guys were gonna get, are going to get this um, um, presentation at the end. So you can click through the different symbols and it will take you to the website. I've curated the most popular, most effective. These are ones that I've personally used, clients I've worked with used and have spoken all amazing things about these tools. They're so user-friendly. You don't need to know anything about um, technology. You, you do need to know a little bit about technology, but not that much. You don't need to be a developer. You don't need to, um, you know, just be all like techie because the language is so intuitive. The building of the list is so intuitive. They give you form functionalities. Um, you're able to build lists using these platforms, automate things using these platforms. A lot of them have um, free versions where if you're starting from small, you can actually just do it for free. HubSpot has a free version. MailChimp has a free version. A lot of them have packages depending on your needs. So I would definitely um, recommend that you start with the smallest package and then as you outgrow it, um, you know, try to advance to something more sophisticated rather than getting all hot, like don't get boggled up with all the cool functionalities that you can use from the beginning. Just use the basics, just build a list, follow the six steps, build the list, think about basic automations, create the content, see the value. And as you get in the groove of it, then you can become, you know, think about what other functionalities would I benefit from? Um, can we use any email domain? Yes, you can. 
there's a lot of best practice um, tips about how, like what domain to use. Um, it's all covered in the in more detail in the course, but if you have any further questions, I can definitely send you recommendations or best practices to your email. So you can leave your email here. Um, I use Zoho campaigns, which is not great. I've heard quite a lot of bad reviews actually about Zoho. It's quite complex. Um, these are super simple. So I definitely recommend you try them out. Okay, so we picked our platform because it's cool, it's free, it looks like it ticks all the boxes. We don't want to pay for anything at this stage. We're just getting started. So we picked it. Now, what do we do? How, where do, who do we send emails to? You have to build a list. So how do we build this list? There are so many ways you can build lists. I've listed some of the most popular ways and effective ways from my experience. Um, you could host a webinar. So you could invite a few guests, do a Q&A, promote it on social media, because obviously we're not anti-social media. We need social media to promote this. Um, put it on your website, put it on your LinkedIn, you know, scream about it and have it gated. As I said, gated means that people can't attend unless they put their information in. And always mention that people are, like give them an opt-in option. You could have an ebook. So HubSpot does this a lot. I download a lot of their ebooks and I am such, I'm their target market. I get their emails all the time, but it's so it works because I'm here to grow my marketing skills and learn more. And they provide really valuable ebooks and white papers on studies. And I'm really curious to read them. I want to learn. I want to grow. So it's really touching into my pain point. So I end up downloading everything they offer and I'm happy. I don't even think about my email. Like I'm quite precious about giving people my number and my email. I mean, especially living in a country like in the Middle East, you guys know how much we get spammed on WhatsApp and Messenger. So I don't easily give up my, my information. But then when it's something that is very valuable to me, I don't even think twice. I just get it because I'm like, I need this piece of information. This is what I need. So if you're offering enough value there for people, they won't even think twice before um, giving you their information and their data. Um, you could also create a masterclass. So if you're offering something like um, a course online, you can, uh, this, this is a great example, actually. <laughs> Astrolabs, I've got you guys. <laughs> and you actually all attended a mini class, a masterclass, because you're interested in this. This is something that you wanna learn more about. And they've got your information now, so they will be marketing to you most likely um, in order for you, for you to end up, you know, eventually getting more of their services. And I think it's, it's so important to have that in mind. It's like, what are you offering? Who are you targeting? And how is this going to lead them to eventually buy our service? A lot of e-commerce shops um, use discount codes, which you've probably all signed up for as well at some point just give us your email or subscribe to our, your, to our newsletter and you get 10%, 20% off. And it really works, especially if you opt in because you, you're then a part of their database. Of course, there's a percentage of people that take the code and then unsubscribe. And unsubscribing is not a bad thing. You wanna get rid of people that are not interested in you. You wanna make sure that that list is like as good quality and as, as engaged as possible. So you will lose some people maybe if you offer just a limited time offer, but you're still capturing an audience that is potentially very interested in, you, in what you have to sell. You could offer free trials. Shopify does this, um, HubSpot does this. There's so many websites that offer digital products and they give you a free trial. And you know, if someone is subscribed to a free trial that you offer a solution that they need. You know already that this is someone very, this is a very hot lead, like very bottom funnel, as we mentioned about the funnel earlier, because if they're ready for a trial, that means they're actually just trying to see if you're the right fit or not because you they have a problem you can solve another fun thing that i've been trying with a lot of my clients lately is quizzes and tests and this is more of a fun engaging piece so you could build a career test or a personality test something that's relevant to what you have to offer as i said as a service and then have the answer be um, revealed if they opt in to get your newsletter and your email and, and you get their data so these are the most common practices. They're the most effective ones. Again, you just have to make sure that you keep in mind 
who you're targeting, what speaks to them, what value are you offering, and how does this relate to the end product that you're actually selling so that it all makes sense at the end. Because if you're doing a master class about digital marketing, but you're actually selling, selling shoes, yes, you'll build the list, but it's not relevant. So it doesn't make sense. So you need to always keep that in mind. Does, does anybody have any questions? Um, have you guys tried any of these things before? Like whether you've tried offering them or you fell for one? <laughs> I don't know, like, have, do you guys have any examples? Anything you wanna share, any stories? I've had a long day too, so it's okay. You don't have to talk. Okay, so we spoke about the third that part of the steps, the six steps, which is we've picked the platform, we've decided how we're going to build the list. Now we have like 150 subscribers. Let's not get ambitious. We have 50 new subscribers. That's super exciting. How do we segment them? It's important to think about, sorry, it's important to think about segmenting the list early on. Um, just so that you have that in your mind, because people fall into just mailing everybody. Um, it's easy to just send one newsletter a month, and that's okay too, because it's better than nothing. But if you have segmenting your list on your mind from the early starts of you setting up your strategy, you're more likely, again, to create a more effective email moving down the line. So what are the different ways we can segment lists? There's usually four ways you can segment lists. You can segment them geographically. So for example, if you're targeting, if you're an event planner and you have some events that you host in Arabic and some events that you host in German and then other events that you host in English, it's actually wise in the form where people are filling in um, their data to also ask about maybe language preferences. Or maybe if you're offering a webinar in Arabic or a webinar in English, you can start thinking about who joined the Arabic webinar because they're Arabic speakers. So they're probably a good list to target for an Arabic event. I'm saying, for example, if you're an event planner, um, comparing to the list of people that signed up to the English webinar who might be interested in an English event. So this is something you can add to the form as like an, a question, a mandatory question under like name, email, and then language preferred. Um, it could be also something geographical, like your, the city. So if you're running um, something, you know, in your store that you have in Dubai, um, then maybe you need to ask for that. Um, and that way you can tag users in the platforms that I showed you based on these different tags. So you can say this person signed up using, signed up on the Arabic course, and this person lives in Dubai. So it automatically arranges your list based on that tag. So if you have something coming up, and it's very targeted to the geog geography or the language, you can filter your list and only send it to the right people. Um, then you can also send uh, segment your list by demographic. So it could be their age, their gender, their family status. Maybe you have a special offers for moms um, or a special offer for, um, can't think of an example, you guys didn't give me much about your industries to give you relevant examples, but you can target someone who has a family compared to someone who doesn't have a family, also based on what they downloaded. So if they down, if a mom downloaded like postpartum depression guide, then she's more likely to, that person is most likely to be a mother who's interested in, um, you know, baby products, for example, or baby services. So you can categorize that as like someone who has a family. Um, you can also use psychographic um, segmentation to split your list. So things like their interests, um, their lifestyle, um, did, were they interested in um, the free trial that included um, luxury lists? Were they um, purchasing something that is um, of a specific segment on your website? So you can kind of base it on that. Or again, add it within your form as a, as a field that they have to fill in. And then finally, one of the most powerful seg segmentations is behavior. So a lot of the tools are actually able to integrate or more, more advanced tools. So it's not something you can do on, um, 
you can actually do it on a lot of the basic tools for some of the basic behaviors, but there's more advanced behaviors that you can start targeting as well. And what I mean by behavior is the user's interaction with your website. So if they came on your website and they added something to cart and they abandoned the cart and they never actually finished the purchase, you've probably received this a lot of the times yourself. An automatic email gets sent to you that evening or the next morning saying there's only two items left of the dress you put in the car, or there's only one item left of the shoes you put, or oops, you forgot something in your cart. The conversion rate increases dramatically when you remind people that there's something in their cart because they've shown engagement, they're interested in that, it's in their size. Usually when you put something in your cart, it's in your size, it's in your preferred color, you're ready to buy, but you just maybe got distracted or you changed your mind. So adding, emphasizing that, you know, and reminding people that, you, you, they've added something to cart and they've forgotten can be really powerful. Um, you can also target behaviors like if they've landed on specific product pages yeah. or if Hannah, they've... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, may I have a question regarding the abandoned cart emails? Mm -hmm. um, I was just about creating the sequence of sending such an email and um, are there any recommendations how many emails uh, I should uh, include in uh, yeah. this sequence and how quickly I should send the first email and the last one in case there would be more than one email, of course? Yeah, Thank so you. there's best practice. That's a really great question. Um, and as the rest of you start building this, you'll probably come, up, like, come across this question as well in your mind. So thanks for asking that. Um, so firstly, how many emails do you send? Best practice is not to send more than three. So more than three, you're starting to annoy people. So between two and three about abandoned cart is good. However, you could start talking about other things in further emails. So you can remind them of their products in different ways. You can send the first email saying you forgot you know, your product. The second email saying we have something similar. If you don't want it anymore, there's like, Another product, like if they're getting a bath bomb, Lush do this all the time. There's similar products to what you ordered in case you missed it on the website. And then if they've still not converted, then usually it's recommended, like I said, two to three emails is best practice. Afterwards, you can start sending them things that are related to bath, not necessarily or selling that product in a different way without actually emphasizing that they've forgotten something in the cart because they know this by now. Um, and then your second part of the question was um, the sequel, um, the, the, sorry, what was the second part? Was it the? Yeah, how quickly how I quickly. should send the first email and the last one, what's yes. the time frame? So usually if you send the first one within 24 hours, it has the most impact because it's still fresh in their minds. Um, the second one can wait a couple of days. And then the third one, also a couple of days and then drop it. Um, so that's usually best practice. There's so much online and I've linked to a few things here um, that we'll talk about, about what best practice is depending on the industry. And it's usually the provide like the providers of the email platforms like these tools because they work with so many different like millions of users, millions of companies in different industries, they can kind of come up with these reports every year of what the best practice for doing something like a sequence like this, or they come up with um, information about um, what's the most like click rate, what's the average abandon rate, what's the average unsubscribe rate. So it's good to be in touch with these when you're starting off, but what's really, really, really important is to keep on top of your own analytics because every industry and every business and every data list is gonna be different. And they all react, even if slightly the same, still very different. So being aware and very sensitive of how your audience reacts to your emails is so crucial and is probably the best thing for you to do. Yeah, uh, the question is because I was a little bit confused because uh, I just started to run uh, my e-commerce startup mm -hmm. uh, a few days ago uh, and I have like zero uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, Shopify recommends is like uh, 10 hours for the first email. But uh, yeah. when I came across Klaviyo, there was, okay, within one hour after the uh, putting something into the card. So that's why I was asking just, is there like um, any recommendation 
in yeah. terms of 24 hours or is usually the rough general i think you also need to think about your own kind of customer and your own product so it depends on maybe they're looking at other things at the, in the meantime so it depends on the value of the product like if it's a laptop it'll probably take them time to take that step for example compared to maybe i don't know yeah, well polish, i sell a nut you know? butter a peanut butter so which is like a <laughs> fmcg product so there is nice. no time to think about yeah so in that case they're probably just forgotten about it or got distracted or maybe changed their mind so yeah you can squeeze that time frame um but again like you said i think this is brilliant what you mentioned because there are so many reports out there and everyone's going to give you a different average and you have to use kind of what you find out there can you know think about your own product and your own user and then just test it just test it, like see if it makes a difference. If it should make a difference in the first 24 hours. If it's not, make the window a bit smaller, you know, and see how that would change the language. And you just keep testing it um, until you feel like you've got the right timing for your business. Yeah, okay, uh, sorry. Um, regarding the testing, uh, A-B testing, uh, what is the proper size of the group, of the target group for doing A-B test? If you have six people on your um, list, you can already A-B test. Like oh. you can A-B test on any size that you have. Obviously, the bigger the, less, the, bigger the list, the more reliable it will be. Um, and I think that is logical in, in any kind of testing, whether it's with ads or with email, you want bigger quantities to be able to measure. But of course, you can start testing right away, especially if you, that list has been like detrived from the same place. So. If you got, for example, um, three people through ebooks and three people through a webinar, it'll be difficult to test maybe and compare because they came from different places, they're interested in different things, and maybe the topics weren't exactly the same. Whereas if you got all of them through the discount code, I think you can start testing right away. Um, I wouldn't invest so much time in testing just yet, though. Um, I would test with the same group for a while, grow that list and actually start understanding the behavior of the people you already have based on the small changes you're making. Because what you could fall into, and I don't wanna to spend too much time talking about your specific business, but I think this is useful for everybody, is when you start testing so early on, the downfall isn't the, the, the only the number of um, like data that you have and how valuable that test is, it's more of, is it worth it at this stage? You know, it's your time is better invested getting a bigger list of people and actually trying different things with that group of people before you start, you know, splitting those lists into multiple tests. And, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like it ends up being like, is it worth the effort at that stage? Um, so my recommendation is to wait a little bit. But if you're keen to test something specific, you can test it right away. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm sorry, I have. Uh one more question Go regarding the <laughs> demographic category yes. um sorry is in the uae some law like uh, gdpr in uh, the european union yes so can i gather information like family status age gender is it like okay to ask my customer okay uh What's your gender? Uh, are you married or not? Or uh, how suppose to ask the people for such information? For me, it's really personal information and I wouldn't share with anyone here. Yeah. The thing is with GDPR is a really good question. To be honest, I'm not sure about the law in the UAE. I've not heard that there is a law against this, but please don't take my word as a final word. I will definitely check this for you. And if you leave your email, um, I, I put my email there. So if you email me, I can double check this for you and ask. Um, but when it comes to GDPR, I think the idea is that people are opting in for this information. It's allowing people the choice to opt in. So you're not stealing this data from them. Stealing this data, like the, the whole idea of GDPR and the data protection laws in general, whether it's in the UK or Germany, and it's not stealing this information and then misusing it. So if you're asking people for this information in a form to opt in and they're choosing to give it to you, there's no problem. You're not breaking any law because they're opting in, you know? Mm -hmm. So whether this exists in the UK, in the, in the UAE or not, 
the idea is opting in and allowing people the choice. Um, but I will double check for you regarding the GDPR in the UAE. Yeah, but, but I haven't uh, heard that that exists. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um... I don't think that such a law is here. Or, I don't think so, yeah. I don't think so. So it's like I can freely ask to anyone for anything and if they would inf- like provide with me with such information, I can store it and send email to them or do anything with mm-hmm. their data like that. Yeah. Sometimes you can be really creative about how you ask them because if you ask them too many questions, which is also something that everyone would be helpful for everybody is it becomes a barrier. Like people are not bothered to fill in so many forms, but what you can do is maybe um, gauge, you know, like for example, offer a workshop for small businesses that have under 10 employees. So you know that everyone that opted in that workshop is considered a small business under X employees. Um, You can offer something specific or tailored for moms. And that was that like um, a peanut butter recipe. you know collaboration with an influencer and she's gonna do like date balls with your peanut butter and it's more likely or very likely that everyone opting in is a mom so you can kind of use that as a tag that you know so you can do more creative ways rather than creating a barrier of having a long list of questions because Mm -hmm. people are not going to be bothered about that for for a recipe video or a workshop you know yeah i get the your point thank you so much No problem. I just want to wrap up this slide by saying um, the behavior, um, like there's a lot of, for the behavior segmenting, there's a lot of tools that actually link up your Google Analytics and your email user database so that you're able to track behaviors. So obviously there's like what you said, the bad in cart and the adding to lists, but you can also start tracking who lands on specific pages, who lands on your specific product pages and maybe doesn't add to cart. So you can kind of gauge what they're really interested in and start sending targeted emails to that. And you can automate this in these tools as well. So someone who's landed on a product page for more than three times and that product is a bit different to, for example, the other product pages, you can start sending them more information about those products and tailor the value added um, content to make it a little bit more personalized. But this is something definitely that I would consider to be a little bit more sophisticated in email marketing. So don't bog yourself down with this in the beginning if a lot of you haven't been using email marketing for a while. So when it comes to content, like obviously you can send anything and everything. You have have your list, people have opted in, they're excited, you're excited. They're probably less excited. You're more excited than them for sure. Um, and it's just thinking about, okay, what are the rules when it comes to content and, and where do I start? There's so much information out there regarding best practices. There's a lot of information about the length of the subject line, um, how to make it more personalized. Adding a name is more likely to get a click than others. And I didn't want to bog you down and overload you with so much information because I thought this was an introduction course. So what we could establish is like main three three main rules that apply to any industry that are not controversial that is like a must have for creating any content piece one have a very clear goal and message of every single email you send what is our goal what are we trying to communicate because if you have too many things jumbled up in one thing in one email people are you're going to lose people they're not going to engage with you anymore um what does your email look like on mobile? Emails are clicked so much more on mobile, especially when it's not when it's a promotional email or an email from a brand, it's more likely to be skimmed on a mobile. So don't forget to optimize your emails for a mobile, just like you do your website. And also make sure that it looks like presentable. So make sure that you're taking design into consideration. And all the tours, all the tools that I offered earlier that I mentioned offer such easy drag and drop ways of building emails and they have so many templates. So there's no excuse for people sending those huge heavy text emails anymore that look like from 2008. Um, And then something that's really, really vital is once you have these two elements there is to include a call to action. That's what CTA stands for. So call to action button. So making sure that you have a button there that either says shop now, read this, explore more, 
there's, it depends on obviously what the goal is. Are we trying to sell? Are we trying to get them to the website? Are we trying to add value? Are we trying to get them to subscribe to our Spotify list? Whatever it is you're trying to do, make sure that that call to action button correlates with the goal and message and make sure not to forget it there and make sure it's working because the amount of emails that get sent out and the call to action button doesn't work, like what a waste of an opportunity. Something else that I find really, really useful and a lot of my clients find useful is email search engines. There's quite a few of them now, but these are one of the two that I like most. They're actually aggregated tools that have emails from all the different brands around the world. And there's fashion emails, there's e-commerce emails, there is the car vendor emails, there's news emails like um, email tuna and milk. These are the two ones and they're linked in the slide. So you'll be able to go. But this is a great place to get inspired when you're getting started or even down the line, because you could have a lot of times when you're just like, I don't really know what to send anymore. Like I'm out of content. This is a great place to go. There's emails from huge brands, small brands. You can see how they visually put the elements together, how they create content, like what the wording is they use. And it's really uh, compatible with the time. So you can see seasonal emails, Christmas emails. It's really, really amazing tool. And I use it all the time when I'm sending emails and my clients use it all the time as well. So these are the two of my favorite ones. The search functionalities are not that great, but you can filter by brand or by date and it will give you, so for example, if you're already planning your Christmas emails, I know some people are crazy and thinking about Christmas already, but if you are already planning Christmas emails, then you, know, you can filter by date and see what everyone's, what all the brands sent for Christmas last year and get really cool ideas. And then you've got obviously Google and Pinterest and all these other tools, but this is very focused on email specifically. Okay, I wanna to touch on email automations. We don't have that much time left because we're already running a bit late. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail. The course definitely goes into more detail when it comes to this, but I just wanted to give an idea of what an email automation is and what it could look like. Um, if you, and I kind of gave a hint, a hint of that throughout the um, conversation already, but this is a bit more detailed example. So for example, we have an ebook. It's one of the suggestions I suggested and it was a great thing, it works. So Daniel opts into this ebook. What happens is you already created because you have this strategy already planned out. You create a little tag on your MailChimp or HubSuite or, um, whatever platform you're using and you create a tag so that anyone that downloads this ebook obviously gets added to our database, but also has a little tag called, you know, they've downloaded this specific ebook. And what happens is a sequence of emails gets sent out to everybody who gets tagged like that. And this, what this creates is you are able to communicate with that user without actually being there present every time some, like you're aiming for volume here. So, Every time someone signs up for something, you don't need to jump and go and make an email or think about them. Oh, they, when are they going to get the next email? It means next month because we just sent the email. It's an automation of, 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 a, of a series where they kind of get drip feed some information and some value depending on how they first got added to your list. So in this example, he, Daniel downloads the ebook. He gets tagged automatically because you have that in the automation settings on your e email platform tool. Then he gets automatically an email sent out as he's added. That's one of the rules that you create. He gets an automation saying, thank you so much for subscribing to our ebook or downloading our ebook. Here it is, click here. And you know what, they're, what, what he's interested in. So you can say, and you can read this blog post as well that talks about the same thing or whatever. And then you wait a day or two days and then you start talking to Daniel about other stuff because you know now that Daniel is either whatever it is you got information from him from the data uh, the form that you collected but you also know that he's interested in email marketing because he downloaded that ebook so now you can start drip feeding information to Daniel about email marketing did you know like a statistic or something that is very informative and it's also a good time to start drip feeding and introducing your brand to Daniel. So because at this moment, he's at the awareness stage of the funnel. He's just interacted with your brand for the first time. 
he might not know what services you offer. All he knows is that you have this interesting ebook or webinar and he's really interested in it, but he doesn't know that you actually offer a service that complements his needs. So you can start introducing that and then you can wait a day or two and then send something that is of value again, that is relevant. And all of this can happen in the background to anybody who downloads your ebook. And this is just an example. This can be sent, this could be created um, and sent automatically for abandoned carts, as we said, for anyone that signs up to any workshop, for anyone that lands on a specific landing page on your website. So these are little automations that you can create. And I think if you just start with the basic ones, like a welcome email, if they sign up for a discount code and a, and a kind of series of three emails to follow. Um, probably if you have an opt-in for uh, down, something downloadable, then a series for that. Just start with one to two automations to see how you feel and to test this tool and get comfortable with it and see it working while you're not actually doing anything. You know, you're, you've done the work already and it's kind of selling itself. So automations can be so, so powerful. Obviously there are endless options to what you can automate, but I just wanted to introduce this so that it's in the mindset from early on. And it's something that you do as, as a part of your email daily practice so that it can start becoming a lot, your email marketing strategy can be a lot more effective, quicker than you, um, wait, you know, into waiting until the end of the month to send that newsletter. Does this make sense? I kind of glanced over it really quick because we're running a bit late. So I, I don't want to confuse anybody, but you can read a lot about it. And obviously the course has a lot more in-depth examples and information about how to actually do it step by step. So finally, once you've done all of that and you have sent your email or two or three, then it's really important to measure your success. Um, I've linked this uh, database, which is from this year by Campaign Monitor that has a benchmark for the different industries. So you can see all the different industries and what is kind of like the average click through, the average click to open, because sometimes you look at that data and you're just, <laughs> someone just received an automated feedback email from Astrolab. See, it, like it just works. And then you'll see that in a few days, you'll probably get another email talking about the course. And it'll probably work on a lot of people that are actually ready to buy um, and are in the right place. So I think it's just thinking about when you're looking at your data, not to get overwhelmed and to think about it in the sense of like, is this good or is this bad? You're not sure. You can take a look at these benchmarks to gauge a little bit of where you stand. But like I said to you guys earlier, it's really important to measure against your own success as well. Just like social media, every business is gonna be different. Um, every audience is gonna be different. So as long as you're starting to see some patterns and you're starting to see who's engaging, who's not, you're starting to see that, you know, actually after, you know, these three emails that we sent after sending 10, the three emails that had like lists on the subject line were clicked the most and the emails that had like the call to action early up in the email were clicked the most then you can start implementing those things a little bit more and more in future emails and that way you'll get the best results but you will not know unless you're having this as a part of your practice when you're when you're sending emails regularly and you can measure it on a monthly basis so don't obsess about every email it's important to have a bigger picture overview so that you can have more perspective. And I just want to add one last note before I wrap this up. Don't be afraid of unsubscribers. People need to leave if they're not engaged because then it just skewers your data. It puts you in a bad mood because you're like, why are they not opening my email? But actually, it's better they unsubscribe because then you know they're just not interested from the get-go. So don't be worried about losing people. Of course, if you're losing masses and masses of people, you need to evaluate what you're sending. It's probably not relevant or not coherent with how you got them in the first place. So if you send a webinar about like um, marriage counseling and then you've got a lot of people in and then you're sending emails about shoes or peanut butter, <laughs> people are gonna be confused. So um, that's a good sign to obviously evaluate your content. But overall, if you're obviously being logical about all that stuff, then unsubscribers are, to me, like better gone than there. Yes, please go ahead. I think someone has their hand up. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you actually, do you have <laughs> any tool to clean up emails? Because I've, um, you know, I have had different companies and different email lists over time. 
Yeah. And all relating to the same industry. And I just want, and a lot of them have expired or people have left the country. And so I know it affects your email open rate if most of them go to the balance or spam or something like that. So do yeah. you have, is there a way to clean? Yes, actually the best practice, I don't have a tool actually that I've tried that I could recommend. I've tried a lot of bad tools, so I don't want to recommend them. But what is the best thing to do when, when cleaning up your list is actually sending out a new email saying, are you still interested in our content? Like, would you like to opt into this new piece of information? Like trying to re-opt people. And it's scary because you're like, oh, I'm going to lose so many of them who don't opt in. But send maybe two or three emails around that. Like send it once and then have everyone that opted in out of that list and then send it again to those who don't opt in. And then those that never even opened your email really need to be cleaned out. Um, and it's really hard for a lot of businesses to do that, but it's actually the most effective because like you said, people move, people change, people outgrow your brand. And a lot of people are just, you're just in their junk and they don't even care like to see what you're doing. And it ends up affecting you and your self-esteem about what you're creating. But like, does even, that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, but for example, so I'm subscribed to a few, uh, email newsletters and yeah. maybe I will open every fourth or seventh newsletter depending on if the title I find attractive at that time sometimes yeah. I'll just keep it in my inbox and I won't open it until for a future date that never happened that never comes basically but so I'm kind of scared to also clean up the list because I know other people work like that as well, right? Maybe I need to keep yeah. it like, and they'll open like the 10th one. Yeah, I mean, it is scary. And to be honest, there's no rule around it. The idea is to think about your list. You want, it, you want your list to be as active with you now as possible. So you want as much of those people to be, for them to, for it to actually be effective. Because what are we talking about here? We're talking about effective email marketing. So how do you get your conversion rate up? You want that list of people to be really warm and really hot, really engaged with your brand. So you want to be one of the seven brands they open regularly or else you're actually not going to see a huge return. You know what I mean? So it's better to have like 200 people that regularly open your email than to have 2000 people with a tiny percentage because then you're thinking about creating an email for all these different segments and all these different people, they're not even opening your email, you know? So if you're thinking about return on investment in sense of time and sense of even these email platforms, as your lists get bigger, they become more expensive. Is it really worth it? It's, it's a very difficult, difficult thing to do because you'd spend so much time building that list. So I empathize with everyone that's cleaning up, but, Ultimately, it's the best practice to get the most effective result. Thank you. No worries. Is there any more questions? Because we're done for today. Um, I feel like I skimmed through everything super fast. Um, and I had to because we only have an hour. So there's usually a lot more details, like I said, in the course. Um, a lot more examples, um, but my email is available if you guys have something specific that you didn't feel comfortable asking in the court, like during this hour, or if you feel like you want more personal details on, then please don't hesitate to email me and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's a wrap for us today.